welcome and thank you for, for coming uh, in spite of this very unfavorable weather. Uh, the fact that you are here, meaning that you do care, uh, this scholars that we are going to honor tonight. Uh, I, because uh, we are going to, uh, to have events related to Buddhism, so maybe I think uh, we should uh, start with this very general remark uh, for uh, Buddhism and the last thing uh, come or goes uh, in isolations. So any phenomena, no matter how tiny, according to Buddhism, uh, one come about without the uh, uh, operations of many, many uh, karma. So uh, today, tonight, uh, uh, we are going to uh, kick off something uh, wonderful. And I am so grateful to all the good karmas, uh, which is have uh, contributes Join the contributes to the um, a, to 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 to, uh, to make this uh, uh, event possible. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tianzhu uh, Foundations for the, uh, very generally uh, sponsors uh, this distinguished lecture series. Uh, Tianzhu Harvest uh, distinguished lecture series on Buddhist studies. Uh, this uh, lecture series uh, was a part, uh, is a part of uh, UBC uh, Tianzhu uh, Buddhist Network. And this is founded by Venerable Da Yuan and, and his temples, Liu Zhu Si, which is uh, some, some of, the, of you might probably know this, named after the six times Patrick. Uh, the Tianzhu Global Networks for the Studies of Buddhist Cultures uh, promotes innovative studies of Buddhism and East Asian culture. Let's cross the boundary between different countries, cultures, and religions. The network's funding provides increased op opportunities for scholarly engagements in a number of ways. Eminent professors are identified for visiting uh, professorship at partner university and to deliver lectures on this particular area of research. Graduate students benefit through fellowship and op uh, opportunities for feedback related to the uh, frog bear project. The riches of these fund will extend to other scholars' exchanges, such as conference, forum, and other special initiatives. We are also grateful for the grant provided by the Social Science and Humanity Research Councils of Canada to support an international and interdisciplinary collaborative, uh, collaborative project called From the Ground Up, East Asian Religions Through a Multis Medium Source and Interdisciplinary Pro uh, perspective, uh, so-called frog bear. The project aims to build a public digital collection of religious material, including texts, artifacts, photographs, and recordings at UBC to enhance public and scholarly understandings of Buddhism and East Asian cultures. So these are our founders. So, and I also want to thank uh, different levels of UBC leadership, uh, including President Arnold, uh, who unfortunately cannot be here tonight with us this evening, but who has already uh, given us the uh, privileges of uh, watching uh, videos that he's uh, sought for this event. Good evening. I'm Santa J. Ono, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia. Unfortunately, I can't be with you tonight, but on behalf of UBC, I'd like to welcome you to the UBC Tianzhu Hurwitz Lecture, A Place for Doubt, The Theory and Practice of Questioning Meditation in Korean Zen Buddhism. UBC is very appreciative of the immense contributions that Dr. Hurwitz has made to Buddhist studies, 
and to the UBC community in particular, the Department of Asian Studies. The lecture this evening will further the study of Buddhism in an academic context, helping to recognize UBC as a leader of the Tianzhou Network and Buddhist Studies and building a community of scholars. Dr. Boswell, thank you for coming to UBC to give a talk this evening. As the premier Western scholar of East Asian Zen Buddhism, you honor us with your presence. Best wishes to you all for a stimulating and enjoyable evening. So, so Buddhism believes that uh, yeah, the Buddha has three bodies. So this is one of the bodies that <laughs> yeah, President Honor says it's not Dhamma party, but yeah, still. Uh, so uh, I also want to thank my colleague and also my boss, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lost King, uh, not only for uh, his support uh, for this Tianzhu uh, project, uh, but also for his uh, very, very generous, uh, very, very generous support over the past decade, right? Since he, were, he, is, he, is, he became the uh, department chair. And uh, I would like to invite Ross to say a few words about our department. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Jinhua, and um, thank you all for coming. I'm not sure where to start, and I'll try and be short. I was asked to say something about the history of the department, but I'm guessing that most of you are relatively familiar with the department. The department was founded in 1961, uh, which also happens to be the year that I was born. Um, <laughs> And that means that, and I became head of this department in 2008, which is some time ago. And this is, I'm coming up on the last year of my headship. Sorry to make this so personal. But once I became head, uh, one thing I, 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 I realized was, you know, we as a department, uh, as of 2008, had, had done very little to commemorate and celebrate um, the sort of founders of our department, the founding fathers of our department. And uh, what then uh, one thing led to another, and one of the first things we did uh, a few years in is we had, um, this would be then uh, in, uh, so 50 years, uh, so 2011, uh, uh, it was our 50th anniversary. Well, that's a nice uh, milestone. Uh, some enterprising alumni on the Japanese side of our department got together and decided they wanted to do something to honor their teacher, Professor John Howes, who passed away just a few years ago at the age of, I think, 92, one of the founding members of this department. And um, I'm delighted that we're now doing something for Leon Hurwitz. This is a name that I've heard uh, since 1995 when I joined the department. Um, and it seems so fitting to be able to recognize his contributions. In fact, my first office in the building was his old office, oh. uh, even though I never met him. Yeah, so uh, I, I think it's, it's really great to be able to do that. Uh, as a department, uh, if you go to our website, which I hope you will, and this, you know, we have really great images taken by our own photographers like this one here, uh, you'll see that we boast of being um, a very uh, robust uh, Department of Asian Studies that focuses very much on the humanities, so history, uh, language, literature, um, popular culture, but especially religion and thought. And within religion and thought, we are very strong on Buddhism. And especially uh, in the past, say, five to eight years, our uh, Buddhist, the Buddhist side of things in our department has grown by leaps and bounds. So we are now teaching courses on Tibetan Buddhism. We have a, a, a tenured uh, faculty member teaching in Japanese Buddhism. Of course, the one big hole we have is Korean Buddhism. And it's really unfortunate that we don't have someone like Robert Boswell to teach Korean <laughs> Buddhism for us. And then most recently, uh, again, thanks to Tianju, all of this wonderful activity um, at the highest possible levels internationally with tremendous partners around the world uh, working on Chinese slash East Asian Buddhism. And so I'm especially pleased that uh, we have Robert Buswell here, who has always um, maintained, whenever I've seen you at conferences, uh, that, or reminded us all that Korea in pre-modern times was a bastion and stronghold of Buddhism in East Asia. And so I'm assuming that we'll hear more about that uh, uh, this evening. Uh, I won't bore you with more history of the department. I want to thank you all again for coming, but I, especially to Hervitz, Hervitz family and, and his descendants and uh, progeny and, and family. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad we can, we can add another sort of plank in sort of thinking about and remembering our past. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. So, uh, 
the office harvests has many uh, that are huge uh, legacies. So a part of his legacy is uh, many, many uh, excellent students that uh, he has trained. So tonight, uh, we have uh, a, the owners, uh, having uh, professors uh, Sonia uh, Anjans, and is correct. <laughs> professors, uh, uh, Professor Emeritus from the Department of East Asian Study and the University of Toronto. Uh, so uh, Sonia is a former student of Dr. Leon Hurwitz. And uh, so now uh, I would like to invite Sonia to give uh, some uh, remark about Leon Hurwitz. Yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's really my honor here today to share some reminiscences of uh, Leon Hurwitz as a teacher. Um, and uh, for that, although I'll be talking about my own personal experience, uh, it really is representative of so many students uh, in the years uh, of 1971 since when he got here. And of course, he was teaching at the University of Washington before that. Um, the, and until his retirement and uh, too early death. Yeah, the, uh, there were so many graduate students in Buddhism at that time who, who studied with him. So um, let my remarks stand for all of them. Um, now, I was going to share my first meeting with Leon Hurwitz um, at a party, a gathering held by Professor Arthur Ling, also a distinguished professor of Buddhism of Chinese Buddhist history uh, to welcome Leon to the department uh, in 1971. And uh, my first impressions of Leon were not that good. <laughs> um, I, found him, I found him prickly, uh, self-absorbed, and socially oblivious. <laughs> um, and I have to confess, my heart sank knowing that he was going to be the advisor of my PhD oh. thesis. <laughs> but how wrong my first impressions were. Uh, you could not have asked uh, for a more kind and supportive advisor uh, as a graduate student. That's uh, what I discovered. He was not at all interested in my topic. Um, which was the poems in Chinese by the Japanese Zen monk of the 15th century, Ikkyu Sojun. It was too far outside the main line of the transmission of Buddhist thought through East Asia, which was um, Leon's real passion. So it was just so, too much of a sideline. Nonetheless, uh, he bent all his intelligence and insight to helping me. Uh, read his uh, Ikkyu's poems. And when I needed letter letters of extension, it was a very difficult topic. I only started studying uh, Japanese, uh, let alone Chinese, in my fourth year at university. And at the beginning of my PhD program, I somehow became the mother of a, of a child. <laughs> and uh, I kept finding motherhood got in the way of scholarship for a while, especially in those early years. Um, so I needed letters of extension, and Leon wrote them cheerfully and enthusiastically. Um, the, and they kept me, in, as a student, in good standing and funded, this is important, <laughs> through all those years. I remember in one of the letters, he always used to share the letters with me, and uh, he said, she's translating the equivalent of dog Latin, he said. <laughs> it's really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, the, uh, what I remember about Leon as a teacher was that he always put grammar first, what the grammar could say, and also a real accurate sense of uh, how words change in meaning through time, that you can't give them a meaning that wasn't accurate for them at that time. Um, and I, in my enthusiasm for Ikkyu's poem, would come up with wonderful meanings for them and bring them in, and Leon would say, it cannot mean that, <laughs> and then explain why. 
but I also remember one time when we were discussing a particular term. The term is feng liu. The characters are only stream uh, or wind and stream, but it can mean so many things in Zen texts through the Song period and also in Japanese. Everything from rustic elegance to carefree lifestyle to free spirit uh, to uh, erotica, <laughs> to, er <laughs> to, to sex, actually. Um, and uh, we were, Ikkyu used it a lot in his poetry. And uh, as I was struggling with it, one day I was talking with, uh, with, with um, uh, Leon and I said, you know, sometimes it seems to me that Ikkyu's use of Feng Liu uh, is close to contemporary, it was contemporary at the time, contemporary slang, far out. And he slapped his knee at that and said, you're right. He said, and before that word came into the English language, there was no equivalent. <laughs> and that was an example of how much he was following the meanings of words uh, through time. I didn't use it to translate uh, for you in the poetry because that would have dated it too much. Uh, slang is notorious that way. It comes in and out of, of meanings. And yes, uh, Hurwitz was absorbed but not with himself, it was with his passion. Uh, and uh, uh, I wrote the essay for his retirement that was published in Asia Forum. And uh, so I was given access to his official CV um, in the university records. And uh, he wrote the best statement of his passion. And so I'd like to read it to you from that essay. He said, what interests me most is the diffusion of Buddhism principally in East Asia. To that end, I have studied a number of languages, from Sanskrit to Japanese, and including Tibetan, Chinese, Mongol, Manchu, and a bit of Korean, also Pali, related to Sanskrit. The phenomenon of language continues to interest me and my principal work whether it involves Buddhist texts in Chinese or medieval literature is language work. In a word, I am a philologist. And I'd like to read from my essay uh, a little bit more. This is a statement of his way, his Tao, his Michi, his single-minded devotion to language empowered him to read texts with a penetrating understanding because he invested no energy in thinking what a text ought to say. He directed his inquiry only to what it was saying. Anyone among the many graduate students studying Buddhism in the years 1971 to 74 will remember the intense reading experiences in the ongoing seminar that met regularly in the home of either Professor Link or Professor Hurwitz and always included Professor Shotaro Ida too, all three professors at the same time. The course changed course numbers to meet bureaucratic necessity, but essentially it was a continuous phenomenon with three professors and usually from six to 10 graduate students. We went through texts, samples only, texts like Song Zhao's uh, treatise, the Vimalakirti Sutra in Chinese translation, and Ancho's commentary on Jizang, a lesser known work. <laughs> and we did it at a timeless pace. If to read one line of Chinese accurately, it took consultation of various dictionaries, looking at the Sanskrit original or reconstruction, or the Tibetan translation, sometimes the Korean translation, or an hour of discussion among our three worthy professors, then we did that sometimes all of that. You might think it would drive students mad, but the opposite was true. The focused concentration of the process was akin to medit meditation and left one feeling somehow clear. Through this training by example, rather than exhortation, there was not one of us that did not come away with a deep respect for what it took to read Buddhist texts, painstaking, became the only way we knew how to conduct scholarship. 
And that was his gift to us, uh, the, uh, to all his graduate students. And I know I, I speak for all of them in this. Um, the, uh, and another gift was his bodhisattva-like patience with our mistakes, which were always corrected instantly. This is when we were reading Chinese texts or when we were, uh, since I was doing Japanese, trying to put them in kundoku, but never with irritation. And finally, his sense of humor, which I think you're going to hear more of uh, uh, from the next, uh, the next speaker. Um, but uh, yeah, it, in that sense, he, was, he always uh, stressed that he was studying Buddhism as an intellectual. Uh, not as a believer. And yet his dedication to exact meaning is one of the greatest gifts that can be given to any religious tradition. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Angens, for uh, providing uh, all these uh, fascinating screams into the uh, careers uh, uh, yeah, Le uh, Leon, Professor Leon Hervis' uh, career as a wonderful mentor. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor uh, yeah, uh, Richard Sling uh, to, uh, to maybe to provide some remarks on the more personal aspect of Leon Hervis' life. <laughs> Please, uh, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, I knew Leon first at the University of Washington in 65, 66, and um, I wasn't a student, but I was uh, uh, around and often attended things uh, together with him. There was an ongoing seminar, and I'm going to talk about humor, wit, and I should have included wisdom, um, and uh, humanity. Uh, all, all of those uh, uh, attributes uh, were quite appropriate uh, or to, to appropriate to, um, ascribed to him. But the ongoing seminar, I didn't think of it before this uh, t tonight, but Sonia's mention of her seminar, there was an ongoing one every month at the University of Washington cr across uh, uh, discipline. And whenever some obscure philological problem came up in any East Asian, Central Asian, because it was the Central Asian, the great um, Mongol, uh, uh, Mongolian, Earl Altaicist, uh, 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 Nicholas Pope was there. Whenever some ob really obscure point came up, it was always, well, Leon, what do you think? <laughs> you know, he was sort of the benchmark uh, for us all. Now, humor, uh, he had a great sense of humor. He was a very funny guy. And um, th this was manifested in various ways. He wrote limericks. He rewrote um, lyrics to Christmas carols in a most outrageous <laughs> but incredibly clever way. I can only remember part of one line, I think it was from, I think, Good King Wenceslas, where, where he turned some line into nimble acrobats with double uh, jointed knees. <laughs> and it just mind boggling, but that, that was you know, from a Christmas party many years ago. Well, I came up uh, from California to uh, be a visiting professor uh, in 81, 82, and I got to know him much, much better then. But the first sort of uh, personal encounter with him was a bit tricky. We had a fire drill. It was about this time of the year, early in the term of 81. And there were notices up all over the place. Fire drill, certain time, certain day, you know. It's not a real fire, you know, take notice. Big signs. And of course, we all knew there was going to be a fire drill. Well, not quite all of us, because <laughs> Professor Hervitz he never bothered to look at such things. <laughs> you know, he was busy with his own thing. Anyway, the fire drill happened, and we all came out, and we were standing outside on the bridge over the, the, the water or on either side and for at least five minutes, waiting for the fire department to come and turn off the alarms. And then he comes out, waving his arm, saying, it's a fire, it's a fire. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody said, oh, Leon, Leon, it was a fire drill. And he said, oh. And he happened to stand next to me. And then he looked kind of sly and cunning. And he said, in a quite a loud voice to everybody, I guess you all thought I was burning with scholarly ardor. <laughs> and I leaned over towards him and said, yeah, fossil fuel. <laughs> and he looked at me 
and I, and I thought I really put my foot in it, and I offended him. But after a pause of staring intently at me, he punched me on the shoulder, laughed out loud, and said, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, the humanity. There's many things one can say about his kindness. Ren, that's one of the Confucian virtues. You, you walk on your way to the Asian Studies Building and you cross by it every day. Well, uh, two things come to mind. Uh, he often ate his evening meal in the diner. It's still there on 10th, just uh, on the other side of, um, of Blanca. And um, I had dinner with him there one night. I lived on 6th at the time, down the hill. And um, we were just getting acquainted, really. This wasn't too long after the, um, the fire drill incident. <laughs> and uh, we were <coughs> chatting, and, and he asked me, uh, well, where, where's your, where are you from? Uh, he knew where I was my, my, uh, as an individual, where I was from. But what's your background? Where, where's your family from, and so forth? And I said, well, uh, all four of my grandparents are Lithuanian. <laughs> Lynn is, my grandfather changed it from Linonis. Yes. All right. He was Joses Linonis. I was Ricardos Linonis too, but I'm Richard Lynn now. Anyway, uh, he said, oh, he said, uh, uh, my, my, my forebears were, were all uh, Lithuanian Jews. And I said, oh, what a coincidence. And he said, hmm, you know, our grandfather's generation, you know, we were enjoying each other's company you know, Gentile and Jew here at this restaurant. That couldn't have happened back then. And I said, well, yeah, I guess you're right. And then he kind of looked kind of pensive and he said, well, maybe things, some things have gotten better after all in this sad world. <laughs> well, and the other thing that, that's worth mentioning, and uh, there's many more things I could say. Um, I had just finished a book and, I, and he asked me, well, who edited it for you? And he said, well, I, I, I edited it myself. Oh, he says, uh, can you do that sort of thing? And I said, yeah. Um, I just finished the manuscript too. This is the Hui Yuan mysterious manuscript that has gone missing. And he showed it to me. Indeed, it was, well, we could say now the Vancouver telephone book, the LA telephone book in those days. And, um, and it was, you know, with arrows pointing to the margins and the scribbles here. It really needed a lot of work. And I said, I, and I had, uh, I rather foolishly said, well, I, I suppose I could edit it for you. I'll make a copy. So I did, and I took it away. But then I had, I was there as a visitor, and I didn't have a real job at the time. And I was out of academe for, oh, close to 10 years. Uh, and I came back, I got, got on my feet, but not right away. And I had to write to him. I was living in Palo Alto at the time, saying that, uh, and I really can't do this. I've got to uh, make a living. I've got two kids I'm looking after, a, a single parent, and I don't really have a job. And, he, and I was a very apologetic, and I didn't know what to expect. But I got a, almost instantly a, 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 a letter back from him saying that, uh, oh, that's all right. I quite understand. And then one phrase really stuck in my mind. He said, you have to look after your own rice bowl. That's a direct quote. I, I remember that exactly. <laughs> And, well, he was a kind man and uh, a great colleague. And, uh, well, I wish you were around longer. But there it is, my reminiscence. Thank you so much, Professor Sneen. And uh, uh, Professor Sneen, uh, be uh, before he retires, it's just like uh, uh, his his wife <laughs> yes, also taught at the uh, University of uh, Toronto, right? UOT. Yeah, I, I um, didn't but, introduce myself. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm so <laughs> glad uh, to, to learn that uh, uh, you was also the former college uh, with Neon Harvest at the UBC yeah. uh, when, you, uh, when you were visiting professor here. So thank you then all for all this uh, story. And now we have, uh, at least for me, a better sense of what a uh, person in Neon Harvest was. And uh, for me, uh, this is a, a lecture series gave me great, uh, great, great pleasures uh, because it has uh, compensated for the deep regrets that I have suffered uh, over the past 
almost two decades since I came to UBC in the, uh, 2001. Uh, because Leon Hurwitz is, is such a hero for me. Uh, he's, uh, of his many publications, he wrote the books on Ziyi, and I, two of my books are also about uh, Tian Tai, and Ziyi uh, actually was the uh, de facto founders of this Buddhist tradition. So I have been I, uh, admiring him for many, many years before I came to UBC, but when I came here, <laughs> I learned that, that he uh, passed away uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, so. Uh, now we have this lecture series uh, in memories of him, and uh, so this is, uh, I feel, <laughs> this is a such, so, such a soothing experiment for me. And uh, it's also such a great uh, a pleasure that uh, we, tonight, we have a dedication <laughs> from the Leon Herbert family. Uh, I cannot interview all of you, but maybe, can you, may I invite the uh, uh, three of you, uh, maybe a Rico, a Rico Herbert. May I may I introduce you to to? Uh, so can you stand out? <laughs> maybe yeah. Uh, so this is Herbert's uh, right. <laughs> and uh, uh, wait, wait, right? yeah, very Herbert. Yeah, then yeah, then so thank you, because uh, I, uh, so now I can compare the Neon, uh, neon Herbs' photo with the real face. Thank you. Well, uh, what an event. Um, it's uh, such a pleasure to be back at UBC once again. I, I have the privilege of having uh, different connections with UBC, uh, both through the Buddhist Studies program that Professor Chen has done so much to, to build and really grow over the last couple of decades here, also through the Korean Studies program that Ross and Don Baker and others have done so much to build as well. And it's just been, uh, it's always an inspiration to come back and to see how much energy and vibrancy there is around this place. Uh, I never, never met Leon Hurwitz. When I was a graduate student, he was sort of the inspiration that all of us, though, were trying to emulate with varying degrees of success, usually not very much success. Uh, and especially um, his interest in trying to look at Buddhism as, a, as a, uh, a broad cultural phenomenon, but also a broad linguistic tradition. Um, he was one of, the, one of those people who um, was really, uh, really a doyen of the field in that he, he really could work and work with great facility in all the major canonical languages of Buddhism. From, um, he, you know, he, he, he claimed to be mostly an East Asian Buddhologist, but his facility in Sanskrit was second to none. Uh, he learned Tibetan from his own Tibetan guru, actually, his own lama that he had on, on site to study Tibetan with. Uh, he was doing this whole panoply of European languages, uh, as well as the entirety of the, uh, the whole Buddhist linguistic um, uh, community as well. So um, I remember years ago, when I was a graduate student, um, his translation of the Lotus Sutra was the definitive translation of my generation. Uh, and he was, it was, it's quite an idiosyncratic, tra uh, idios idiosyncratic translation if you look at it, because he felt that the way to do the translation was to use a definitive version, the oldest version of the text that we have, which is from Kumarajiva's Chinese translation. And yet he also wanted to look back at the earlier, uh, at, uh, at the uh, Sanskrit recensions of this text, to go back to 17th century Nawari manuscripts. So he uh, had probably in front of him when he was doing this translation, uh, a whole range of different manuscripts of this text, while focusing always on Kumanajiva's translation. And so he was constantly, if you look at his notes, he's constantly going back and forth between these different editions, even though he's translating from a single Chinese source, actually. So, uh, I mean, just incredible the, the degree of, of linguistic and, and philological competence that he had. But I think also um, we forget that despite the fact that he would have uh, probably called himself a philologist, and I think did call himself a philologist with, with good reason, his approach to Buddhism um, in many ways sort of led the field in an entirely new direction in looking at the kind of socio-cultural context of Buddhism in East Asia. And this is really the direction the field has gone. So if you think about his article, uh, Render and the Seizure in Chinese Buddhism, for example, uh, you know, he's really looking there at the ways in which, in which Buddhism and the state were interacting and how Buddhism had to adapt to and conform to the interests and needs of the Chinese state at the time as well. And so he sort of pointing out a whole new direction that the field could take in the course of its development. So 
I mean, I, I bet, uh, you know, I, I, I never had the privilege of meeting him, unfortunately, but I, I bet if he were to look at the field now, uh, he would be uh, extremely gratified to see how the field of Buddhist studies had grown in the West, and especially how Buddhist studies has flourished on, uh, on his campus of UBC at the same time. I'm going to go uh, in a rather different direction than I think he probably would have gone, because uh, uh, Zen texts, as uh, Sonia mentioned, were probably, for him, kind of outside the mainstream of the, of, the, of the process of disseminating Buddhist ideas from India across Central Asia into East Asia eventually.